anyway. Hey, uh, thanks, man. I, I appreciate the, uh, I'm probably a shitty friend that, uh, <laughs> We've never really contacted very well. And, uh, you probably have a better friendship with my wife than you do me. <laughs> Man, you're, you're busy. I mean, you haven't stopped. I mean, I'll yeah. keep it on you. You're just like, yeah, the only way to stop is to die, man. That's the way, you know what I'm saying? You're in Greenville. You're still in Greenville. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, the thing about, cause I'm working with ProFence at the moment and our, um, our East coast office is actually in Addison. Mm. Um, so I was actually there a couple of months back, but I'd just in and out, but right. I've got another visit coming up, mate. So we'll have to meet up for dinner and a few beers. Well, come an extra day because, uh, I helped, uh, set up a range here that we can get out to 1500 and, uh, Done deal. I, mean, I got a, I got a fun gun, uh, that I helped develop that you got to take a, a look at. It's a 300 win mag AR, which is pretty interesting. Nice. I like the sound of that already. Yep. Well, so, uh, uh, everybody listening and watching, uh, Mark Spicer is, a one of, a, one of the best, you know, snipers that I know, uh, he's a little older than I am. Uh, but, uh, he spent his life, uh, uh, doing God's work. And, uh, he has a book out that I really like everybody to pay attention to. And so welcome Mark. Thank you. Uh, and thanks for having me on the show, mate. Really appreciate it. So, uh, I, the, the simple questions are, are always interesting that I always forget to ask and I have to write them down up front. Otherwise I really will forget, uh, uh, the things that people really want to know, but they don't, uh, ask. And one of them is when did you get into shooting? Um, to be honest, it was, I guess it was one of those things that you can't really shoot in the UK. Uh, and unless you're military or police, obviously mm. we kind of lost that, uh, that right. And I came from a fairly poor background. So, so guns as a hobby was not an option. So it was really when I first joined the military, I found, you know, I found, I loved it. Found I had a, a natural sort of aptitude towards it, uh, which kind of led me into sniping. Mm. What well, did, so then jump right into, uh, what part of the Brit military were you in so that everybody understands, uh, that idea. I, was, um, I spent the majority of my career in, um, in the infantry with uh, recon and sniper units and also in covert counter-terrorist units. So mm -hmm. on that side of life, we were, our job was to get as close to the terrorists as we could and keep them under surveillance. Uh, the provisional IRA were not as willing as ISIS to get enough into a fight. Mm -hmm. um, so we were very much restricted to getting anything that was admissible in court as evidence. Mm. So a lot of the time, if, if your house was the best place to watch a terrorist house who lived opposite you, then we'd wait until you and the wife are at work. We break into your house and, and hide in the roof space for a week mm -hmm. um, and just run out of surveillance off from up there. You you get to hear some interesting things downstairs. So a lot of the sure. time, the hard thing about staying covert is not laughing. Um, but yeah, it was a it was a fun job. Um, and as I say, it, the unit tended to draw from people from reconnaissance and, and the sniper world anyway with the British army being so much smaller than the U S side, um, the special operations world tends to pull from the infantry. Mm. So, uh, everybody, you, you brush by a, a historical significant point that people that, uh, may not recognize, uh, what the British military did, uh, and then it ended, but, you know, through Northern Ireland and, uh, uh, the interesting dynamic that was between you guys and the Irish for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And you probably came right into that. Yeah. I, I did multiple tours in, in Northern Ireland, I did both over and, and covert kind of terrorist units. Um, that's really what puts us at an advantage right now. And one of the things that I've spent certainly the 15 years that, that I've now lived here and become an American citizen is passing that on to American police departments. Um, domestic terrorism obviously isn't new in the UK. You know, we, we lived it for 36 years. And to give a quick example, my, my children would never get into our family car without checking underneath it for bombs. Mm. So it, it really became a way of life. So, and we learn, I mean, we got our backside handed to us on multiple occasions. Mm -hmm. The IRA are very good at what they do. Um, most of the bomb designs that have been killing American troops in Iraq and Afghanistan um, are provisional IRA designs. And mm -hmm. they're kind of a corporation in the business. They make their money by selling those designs to other people. So one of the things I've been doing is, is taking that experience that the British Army, the British police have, 
um, and pass that on to you know our family in, in the US police departments who are now just facing execution, being targeted and, and everything else that, that comes with domestic terrorism. And so you decided, uh, when did you decide to write? Um, I wrote my first book. I think it was 2003. I'm, I'm getting old, mate, so numbers mm -hmm. are, are drama. Um, I think it was around 2003, and it came about because an old World War II sniper um, reached out to me. Um, I first became aware of him when I was attached to the, the US Marine Corps, and they had his picture on the wall. Um, very private man. He, he went into a government agency after the war, hence his, his privacy. But it, he eventually reached out, and I used to spend hours in his house just talking about sniping and various other things. Um, and I was... I was bitching, to be honest, about all the sniper books out there being written by people who've never been a sniper. Mm -hmm. So he just challenged me and said, write one or shut up. Um, so I wrote the first book in 2003, and then the rest of them became, um, you know, what, what my life was, which is sniping. Um, mm -hmm. So there were four books that, that were by me. Um, um, certainly one of them was, was a co-author with somebody else. And about sniping, and, and this latest book was complete probably a complete u-turn for, for me um obviously with the the latest book is is more focused with trying to help sort of our family brothers and sisters uh, within the military and the police deal with what the world knows as ptsd mm -hmm. um and one of the things i'm trying to do is i'm trying to smash down two walls one that says it's a disorder it isn't. It's an injury. And I think, and I'm sure you've come across it. Agree. Half the problem is people won't come forward. They don't want to be labeled with a disorder. Mm -hmm. You know, disorder would indicate something that can't be fixed. And I was lucky enough to get to know two doctors who've been working on this for years. Um, and they explained it perfectly when they said it's no different to breaking your finger. The only difference is you broke a part of your brain. Mm -hmm. And just like your finger, it's repairable. So it may not all ever be quite the same again. It's going to be stronger in some ways, weaker in others. Um, and the longer you take to treat it, the longer it's going to take to fix it. Or it heals wrong. Yep. I agree. Yeah, or it heals completely wrong. Um, so it became personal for me. I mean, I'd suffered uh, from PTSD. I'm not in my military career. My military career never really seemed to bother me. Um, on reflection, part of it's maybe bothered me more than I thought. But not to the extent that it, it actually caused me issues. The thing that caused me issues was actually my wife's suicide. Mm. Um, and because of the way the army trained me, you know, at the time I was a retired sergeant major, I don't need anybody's help, I'm tough mm. enough, it was the attitude. I was wrong, mate. I was absolutely wrong. And for a decade, I, I, I lost a decade of my life while I was fighting something that I didn't know I was fighting. Yep. So I wanted to get rid of the D. Um, and then the second one I noticed was... Everybody labels it a veteran's illness. They found a mouse. <laughs> they just found a food bowl they wanted to throw across the floor. Um, and, and it was, you know, everybody was going on about it's, it's a veteran's injury. And it, came, it became really obvious to me when I was talking to a civilian friend. And, you know, guys having some trouble. And, and I pointed out to me, you do know you have all the symptoms, um, you know, of PCSI. And his answer kind of shocked me, mate, because he said, I, I can't have that. I've never mm -hmm. served. <laughs> you don't have to serve to, to suffer traumatic injury. I agree. Um, and he actually said to me, well, I would never tell a doctor that. It's like stolen valor. Like, no, no, that's completely different, mate. It really isn't. But it did highlight to me that preconception that unless you're military and you've been to a war zone, you can't have suffered this. And then my answer was, Okay, so what about what about the police officer who's just carried a, three dead teenagers from a car wreck? What about the firefighter who can't get to that child through the flames? A mother who's just buried a child? A young nurse who's just lost her first patient? The list is endless. Mm -hmm. um, so I want well, how would, how would you define PTSI then? Like if you were you know since you have a military brain like I do, everything yeah. has this definition and distinctions and. What you Absolutely. do about it so how do you define ptsi well one of the things that i've found from learning to speak to the doctors um, is there are very clear list of uh, symptoms that would associate that to to ptsi 
-hmm. and and one of them is is self isolation. One of them is you are hyper vigilant about absolutely every, everything. And you almost kind of live in a, an alternative reality to what the world sees, because it shuts down of your frontal lobes of your brain where mm -hmm. logic is, and you then live where we lived most of our life in the right. sort of lizard brain area of fight or flight. Uh, and on a day-to-day -day basis, that isn't a good place to be living. So it's, you start to think that nobody understands and that um, everybody is wrong and you're right. Now, I can certainly look back on some of the things I did where in an argument, everybody was to blame but me. But on reflection now, <laughs> that argument was entirely my fault. Um, but at the time, I couldn't see it. Um, and the, the problem is it pushes people into a very dark place um, where they, they self-isolate, they start to turn on the world and they start to then believe that they are a burden. Um, and I'll give you an example is I've met so many guys that I'm sure you have that reach out when they're out of the military because your brothers and sisters are your support system while you're mm -hmm. serving. When you leave, that's suddenly ripped away from you. And the military does a very poor job of helping your psyche readjust to become a civilian. Well, everything from our sense of humor to our work ethic doesn't fit in the civilian yeah. world. Yeah, it still so, doesn't fit. <laughs> it never will. The one thing that, that they've changed is for, for life, but they could help us fit back in. Um, an example, military, we stop and have a rest when we're finished. You know, that a tea break is at the end because we never know when the enemy is going to turn up. So we keep going until the job is done. Mm -hmm. So... You know, that, I've found that that actually can alienate certain civilian workers who will accuse me of making them look bad. You know what? You never take a break. You never have a lunch. Yep. Um, that makes you feel isolated. Our sense of humor is different, completely different to a civilian's. We'll laugh at stuff that some civilians are absolutely horrified about. Yep. And they see it as we don't care. Now, the things that I know you've done in your career echo it. We care more than anybody else on the planet I and mean, i've never met anyone that cares more than than the military do you know we go and do what we do because we actually believe in our country and and the way of life that it gives us certainly not for the money we both know that we don't get paid enough to do that so it's you can't you can't fit back in and we can't explain to people that we laugh at things not because we don't care we laugh at things because we found that humor gets us through mm. we will always find a joke in the worst situation because that gives you that courage to get up and keep fighting. That's one of those, the, the, your British humor, the working with the SBS and several SAS guys and units over the, from the, <laughs> from where you grew up. Uh, I, I could hardly function because you guys would make fun of everything. I thought I was, you know, I could make fun of anything. Oh my God, you guys come up with the funniest shit. I would be laughing in the middle of patrols just by watching guys' reactions and they don't even say anything. I'm like, oh my God, I, I can't even function anymore. There's guys that they'll, they'll they'll be laughing and joking in the middle of firefights because, and it's not because they don't think it's serious. It's because that, you know, alleviating that fear aspect or, yep. or making each other laugh. It actually, it's, you found it. It gives you confidence. Yep, absolutely. And, and there's, there's a joke about, you know, where Brits will just say, you know, are we going to do this or are we just going to stay here? They don't want to get up and get shot at, but that humor gives them that courage to get up. And for me, and you, you've experienced it, if, um, if my friends are not ripping into me, then I'm worried. Then I'm going yeah, to start. 100%. Yep. Um, if they go quiet on me, then I must have done something wrong. Yep. Uh, and I think the very good definition is a true friend is the one that will, you know, rip into you uh, to your face, but he'll have your back when you're not there. Um, yeah, and, and then two seconds after a, a good thrashing, they're your friend again. Absolutely. You can even get in a massive, you know, fight. Fist and then fight. It's so. always ends up better, better friends at the end. Yeah. I mean, because we, we are passionate people by definition. Um, we do have strong, strong opinions and our opinions are not always correct. Uh, and you, you can fist fight somebody over it. And then five minutes later, you're risking your life to go and get in because you've been wounded. Yep. Same so idea. the name of the new book, before we forget to mention it, is what? Oh, yeah. um, it's, it's called Out Dance the Devil. Um, and basically, when I was sitting around kicking around names that the book could be called, I knew it had to be something that painted a picture. And you, you know yourself, Brits, uh, we can't do anything without painting a picture. We have to describe something. Um, it's usually where the humor comes from. So I wanted a title that 
painted a picture. And for me, I found that PTSD, PTSI, whichever one you want to use, you're fighting yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not fighting the world. You're not fighting anything. You actually end up fighting yourself. So the battle is going on inside you. So out dance the devil, um, fitted with, with my beliefs. You know, I, I totally believe in God, not 100% convinced on most organized religion. Uh, and I believe that if the devil exists, we create it. You know, we create hell in our own heads. Um, and, you know, PTSD, PTSI is probably the per- perfect example of that. For me, I created a false reality inside my own head and, and it was a good place where, you know, I, there were times when I put a gun in my mouth more times a day than I can remember. Um, and these noisy lunatics that I've got wandering around here were the main reason I'm still here. Mm. So Out Dance the Devil seemed to be like a good title because it was me fighting me and that there was a devil inside me that I was battling with. Yeah, the, uh, the analogy of the devil, uh, I think, is rather apropos for, you know, guys that are and women that are, you know, military listening to this and or watching it. Uh, I, I don't think there's the devil. I think there's darkness that comes in isolation. Absolutely. Yeah. But I, to get across to everybody, everybody has different beliefs and different things that they're, they're willing to focus on. And I think yeah. that, I think that's great. Uh, and I would highly encourage anybody um, to find what motivates them, what, what gives them the courage to go from day to day and stick with it. Mm-hmm. So I, I absolutely agree with you. For me, it was a darkness. Darkness, hundred percent. Everywhere, yeah. my entire day was just locked in darkness. And I gave the analogy in the book where I said, the reason you can walk into your own house in the dark and hit the light switch first time every time is, is familiarity. You know where you are. You know where it is. Well, you find a darkness that you're trapped in inside your own head, where you you have no idea where the light switch is. Mm. Um, and the simple way for me to explain it was the problem is people can't find the light switch and they end up going the wrong way and they just go deeper and deeper into the dark until they're lost. Yep. And that's when you hear about people taking their lives. Mm-hmm. You know, guys, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you know people as well as I do. Last person in the world you have expected to, to take yep. their life. Yeah, we just had uh, uh, one of our brothers do that. That was literally the last person. There was no way this dude would have done it happiest guy i've never seen him raise his voice he's never been upset has great everything and last monday with no reason to it is gone well we're we're both snipers we understand how important camouflage is but in some cases and and ptsi is one of them camouflage is a bad thing but i found at my worst um i created such a fake reality around me that everybody thought i was fine um, but the second I would come back in my front door, collapsed, mm. absolutely collapsed. I, you know, didn't want to live. Just, mm-hmm. I just wanted everyone to leave me alone. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I used camouflage. You know, I, I basically hid what was going on from me. And I found that most people that tell you they're, they're suffering from depression or suffering from PTSD, generally are not. Um, but the people that tell you they're fine, generally are. Um, Everyone I know that's, that's ended up taking their own life through depression or, or PTSD n- didn't have a clue. Nobody had a clue it was coming. Yep, yep. It is. I've become very, very good at concealing it because they feel, and I know because I did, you feel a burden. You, you, mm-hmm. you almost feel like you've let your mates down because you kind of reach out to them and they respond because most of your friends are still serving. Um, you know, when you, when you call them up, they respond in exactly the way that they've been trained to do and the only way they know it's from the bottom of their heart but it's not what you need and it's that man up attitude Mm -hmm. you know and they'll tell you with all the best intent in the world you'll be fine mate you can do this soldier on man up keep going and you come off the phone and you feel great for about i don't know maybe a couple of minutes and then you start thinking i've let them down they think i'm weak i'm a burden and you stop calling you stop reaching out And then you're further and further into the dark. Um, So eventually you start to believe you are the problem. And Mm. I certainly got to a point where I believed I was a problem. And I believe the only way to relieve the world of of me was to go. Mm. Um, Even down to pushing people away. Mm -hmm. I I was rude to people I didn't want to be rude to. Um, 
I ignored people, I withdrew from, from friendships because in my, in my messed up head, I knew what my wife's suicide had done to me. Hmm. And I didn't want friends of mine to feel that way. So I thought if they, if they thought I was a complete wanker before I did it, uh, it wouldn't hurt them. They'd go, hmm. well, deserved it. Um, and I would somehow be saving them grief. Hmm. You know, you're, you're thinking what you think is logically in it just isn't me um, you're you're coming up and, and for me i even did a i even did a time analysis a time study of okay i've got to get the bank sorted i've got the mortgage sorted i've got to make sure my kids are okay mm-hmm. and I, I worked out a timeline so i had a, I had a time and a date right um, and i worked towards that and in between that i just kept lying to everybody the uh so these dark places that we go one you know since uh we have the commonality of military and all war is a dark place. Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, sniping, uh, is one of the most isolated dark, uh, positions that you can put yourself in. Even when you're with your buddy, you're mm-hmm. not on the planet together. You know what I mean? Even you're if not. you're, so the two people become one in isolation, the whole world doesn't exist, but you two, I don't think the enemy, I never gave any account for the enemy. Like I didn't care about them. They were just something that I was doing. They're moving paper or moving steel targets that have blood that come out of them. And, and that puts you into a dark spot. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's, I mean, there's two aspects from that. As you know yourself, that uh, sniping has got, has got a higher failure rate than just about any other military training class. Cause it isn't for everybody. It, it is a very specific um, type of human being that can to, can get into that um, and it doesn't make you dark or sinister um, it's just that you have an aptitude um, to put yourself in a position that nobody else wants to be in mm-hmm. you how many times have you heard I'm in the bubble I'm in the zone or you just literally shut the world out because you are trained to shut the world out and yep. focus you are trained to do exactly what you've just said it's just a still target right it, it just pops red you know, when you shoot it. Yep. When I was at the British Army Sniper School as an instructor, we had a lot of foreign sort of allied nations that would come in. And I asked them all the same question. What is your country's policy on sniper prisoners of war? They all said the same thing. We don't have one. We, mm-hmm. we never take snipers prisoner. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's that added stress. You know, even, a, even an SF team will go out as a four-man team or, or an eight-man team. We go out in twos or on our own. Uh, it, it's a very different level of, of stress. Yep. Now, the reason I think we actually can just disassociate human being and they just become a, a steel target is because we have rules of engagement. We are aware of what our rules of engagement are. Both the US and the UK military retain the right to refuse an inappropriate order. So there is an element of, you know, integrity in what we do if, if we feel it isn't justified if we feel it isn't necessarily in the commander's intent we don't have to carry it out mm. and i think the reason we do and the reason so many snipers are so successful now is we have rules of engagement and they're based on human decency they're, mm. they're based on human rights um some people just I, need to go know, i've had to i've had to try to explain this to people like you have in retirement and uh I, I, I would add something to that and to everybody paying attention to this, uh, to, to cap off this darkness, isolated conversation. The reason why snipers are become functional, because once you've done it once you, what we have in the military that we don't then have in the, once we retire is even though I'm in my bubble, I'm with my sniper buddy, or I'm a sole shooter by myself. I know immediately when I get back to my brotherhood or to the platoon or to the unit, I can be, I can say anything. I can say, I'm dude, that was scary. I thought I was going to die. I can make jokes about it. And everybody is welcoming, welcoming you back. And, you know, I'm not a, you know, I, I don't know as much as you do about PTSI, but, uh, that's one of the things that helped us in the sniper teams and in the SEAL teams. And what I've been able to do on the outside is you got to keep a brotherhood with somebody. 
somebody you can go to and have weak moments. They make fun of you. They, and you can say and be and do anything in the moments that you have with your brothers. And uh, that's what, why most of us are getting out and getting PTSI is because yeah. like you said earlier, it's ripped out of you like giving birth and you can't get back in and you no, can get it on the outside. There's all, there's enough dumbasses out here. that are just as stupid as you, you know, it is. And we, we are different and we don't, we don't try and be different. We've just, um, and I'm very careful in the book to point out that I, I 100% agree with the way the military basically breaks you down in basic training and then rebuilds you to be what they need mm -hmm. you to be. My only issue is, like, say, for the British Army, that they'll give you two weeks where they'll train you to be a plumber or an electrician so you can have a new career when you get out. Nobody tries to work on your psyche to allow you to fit into a society that does not understand you and is never going to understand you mm -hmm. because they've never seen what you've seen. They've never experienced what you've experienced. Um, and you know how many times you deployed on a patrol and the tension and the stress of any minute now, any minute now, and then nothing happened the entire patrol and you get back into base. Mm -hmm. And that emotional dump um, is, is powerful. And the level of stress that you went through that entire patrol is something nobody else is mm -hmm. really going to understand. And, and it just builds up and you can only put so much in a cup until it overflows. And for most of us, we managed to get a big enough cup to last our career. And it's mm -hmm. when we come out and we don't have that brotherhood um, or, or sisterhood support around us that we're used to, we start to overflow. Um, and then there's a lot of anger involved in it mm -hmm. because you're not angry at the world per se, you're defensive because you're made to feel you don't fit. Mm -hmm. uh, and then yeah. it's like anything. I mean, my brother may be the biggest idiot in the world, but if you tell me my brother's an idiot, I may know you're telling the truth, but I'm still going to defend him. He's my brother. Yep, yep. Uh, you lost that you really are isolated um and it's difficult and, and i want to get across to people that, you know it's okay not to be okay you know mm -hmm. it's, if you got shot and you went down on the battlefield you wouldn't hesitate to call for me knowing i'd come and get you or we've got to get across to people this is no different you know if if you find yourself locked away in your house if you find yourself isolating from people you've got to reach out you've got to get across to to your brothers and sisters i do need help and they'll come. I've never seen anyone not come. Yeah, I, I'm, I agree with that as well. So what's happening in the, uh, I don't know uh, what's going on in the UK, uh, just because I don't have the pulse of what, you know, because y'all have been at war as long as we have. Mm -hmm. Even prior to that up in Northern Ireland. We tend to start. Unique and want to experience. To brother. <laughs> so. And uh, so uh, what we realize now, there was a bad stigma when I was a new guy in the, in the SEAL teams, probably up until maybe 2010, if you said that you had mental issues, your career was done. Exactly. There were, yeah, you're out. You guys. And, and you're, it, well, man, I just got back from a combat deployment. I'm at my prime, like at post deployment, unless you've broken something or been injured or shot or something, uh, you're at your prime. And, but you're at your PTSI prime, like you, you mm -hmm. have mental issues, your chemistry has changed. You, you don't function well. Like every time I'd be picked up by Stacy post deployment, she'd be like, oh, you're 10 years older. And I'm hyper vigilant. Oh my God, how do I fit in? So what the SEAL teams are realizing now is 90% of the community, the operator community has massive issues either no by scar can't. tissue or by PTSI or whatever. There's, there's no way they can't. I mean, yeah. and one of the things that I've come across is, and if for nine years, I refused to go to a therapist. As far as I was concerned, anybody that would only talk to me if I had money or would only talk to me one for an hour a week, that's not a friend, that's not support. Mm -hmm. um, what I didn't take into account is that they're kind of like military interrogators. They kind of lead you down a, a path until you have no choice but to face something. Um, and, and mine certainly showed me a lot of, I had like three major triggers that I'd had from childhood that influenced my day-to-day -day life. And I wasn't aware of that. And now I know what those triggers are. And I also know what it feels like when they start to kick in. So I now know what to do to avoid it. And then the doctors that wrote a chapter for the 
for the book for me, introduced me to Newcom. Newcom is basically, it's a meditation app, but within the, within the meditation sort of functional wind chime type music they always play you, I picked up on there were certain key notes that kept turning up. Mm. So they explained it to me that MRIs and, and various other technology have proved that certain frequencies heal the human brain, mm. repair it. So while you're just laying there listening to this, it's, it's almost like putting a brace on your finger if it's broken, mm. it's, it's fixing you. Uh, and there are, there are various levels for various times of the day. They vary from 20 minutes to two hours. And I recently found out, I spoke to the doctor who invented it, that the SOCOM community are already using it. The mm. US Air Force are already using it. Because, you know, I know they tried immersion tanks and various other things. One, expensive. Two, you can only get so many into a building. Whereas with Nucom, you just need your phone and a headset. You lay on your bed. Uh, and it, it works. And, I mean, I've got to be honest, it's made a big difference to me. I, I, got, I finally accepted medication um, after fighting it for years. Mm -hmm. But I hated it. And I hated taking it every day. Um, Nucom, I'm off. I don't take medication anymore. And I don't need it because mm. this stuff just keeps me balanced. And it just defogs your brain, mate. It just allows you to think logically again. And you don't immediately go into fight or flight uh, and get defensive. You're totally calm. And I, I look at different aspects from a different way. But it's until we find something like that that works for you, um, we, we end up feeling isolated because... You're still in the dark tunnel looking for light. Yeah. And the reason, it doesn't matter how bad we were in the military, we always had our mates who would chest poke us, tease us, make us laugh, have a beer, whatever it was that was almost self-medication. You, you didn't have enough time to overthink. And when you come out of the military, certainly I found when my support structure was gone, I had too much time on my hands. Oh, to yeah, that's true, man. And man, I just, I just found, a, I, I found a path that went deeper and deeper mm -hmm. into my head. Um, and it was a good place to be. Yep. And I had to find a way out. And it wasn't until we were doing, and I think you've done the same thing. It's 22 a day in the UK as, as much as it is in the US. Mm. And every now and again, you get challenged to do push-up challenges, 22 a day. You've got to video it because nobody trusts anybody. I think we're encouraged to give an experience for you, from your own life. Well, by day five, I was getting a lot of calls from, from mates from the military going, dude, You've had a shitty life compared to most of us. You need to write a book. And I just dismissed it. Mm. Um, and it wasn't until I had an incident that kind of affected my marriage that suddenly realized, you know, PTSI, PTSD could come back. You know, mm. I thought once you got rid of it, that was it. It can come back. It can be triggered again. And it tends to lurk in the dark in your head that I thought, okay, maybe I need to do this. Mm. Um, and it's become a little bit of a passion of mine now where, I'm, I'm sick and tired of seeing good people die, of mm -hmm. seeing good people's lives ruined, and the people that love them around them's lives ruined by something that's treatable. You know, it's not a disorder. It, you can fix it, and it's pretty easy to fix. It's just that we are trained never to ask for help. Mm -hmm. It's a weakness. Yep. You know, yep. The thing I always hear is, big men don't cry. Yeah, we do. Mm. I've lost count of the amount of times i've sobbed my heart out in this building um and you know people say oh, it makes you weak call me weak when i'm crying <laughs> i'll knock you out mm -hmm. it doesn't make me weak yeah yeah. It just means i'm having a hard time and I'm, I'm getting rid of it and i think it's the body's way of emptying the cup you know that that crying thing uh it's uh unless you've been through a hard training you don't recognize that uh anxiety difficulty loss always makes hard men cry like going through you know hell week and was my first experience of seeing tough dudes cry and, and the thing is nobody laughs at you think everyone's gonna laugh at you i've never laughed at a, a, a colleague who's cried and no, nobody's never. ever laughed at yep. me when i cried to be honest they tend to come over and comfort you yep and they genuinely care that you're okay uh, and so i got to a stage where i started telling people look cry you know, if you find yourself suppressing, crying, there's a reason for it. Yep, you, yep. cry, you have to bore your eyes out until you can't cry anymore. Yep. From until you laugh. Point. That's my solution. Cry till you laugh. <laughs> I, laugh. I annoy yep. everybody at work because I have to joke about everything. 
but that's part of my survival system yep. is I don't take anything too seriously. Now, yep. underneath, of course I do, but on the surface, I'm that guy I know who just wants to make everybody laugh, have fun, tease everybody, which I'm, I'm sure, well, I know is annoying to some people. It's part of my survival structure. And I, so I'm like you, mate. I'll laugh at whatever I can laugh at. Yep. Yeah, the, yeah, one of the... One of the most unique, uh, cause everybody's like, Oh my God, these guys cry. So I want to cap it off on this conversation. Uh, when we were in Afghanistan, I happened to be a platoon chief, which was grace of God that I was able to lead these dudes and we got overrun, got our shit cooked backwards. It was terrible. And a 45 minute firefight. And you know, the length of time that's like an eternity Forever. and, uh, we ran out of ammo. And we had to call J dam in on our position and we survived and all of us were crying and it was it like, like it was a catharsis just to be alive and nobody could stand up. Nobody could function and like pissing your shit in your pants, everything like the yeah. worst human being on the planet and nobody judged anybody else. There was none of that going on. I always say to people, you know, that there are various, there are various phrases that I've come across in the military. One is I'd rather burn than rust. I actually saw on the back of a, uh, a Lynx helicopter pilot's helmet, which worried me a little bit. But, um, and the other one is if you're not living on the edge, you're taking up too much room. Mm. Uh, and as much as we joke about them and they're very cliche and, and tough to say, there, there's an of truth to it. And I think unless you've actually physically risked your life, I don't think you're ever fully going to appreciate life in the way, mm. you know, a military male or female will. Um, and I think that that sobbing that you just talked about there is that thankfulness that you still are alive because you understand the joys that that is life. You know, yep. you get to see your wife again, you get to see your kids again, you know, you'll get to have a cold beer again, laugh with your friends. Yep. It is that overwhelming thankfulness that you're still here. Uh, and it's sad to think that that joy for life that we've all experienced can get lost inside mm -hmm. your own head to the point. That well, so I want to ask, uh, so we've been talking military sniping PTSI and the, the transition that, uh, happens when you get out, especially you probably were in probably longer than I was, uh, what, how did you replace it? I know you replaced the brotherhood, the excitement, the, the life, the living on the edge moments in time after you got out of the, out of the military, where did you find some equal replacement? Cause I think that's, what's missing most of the time is we don't replace. Um, and I've, I've got a lot of guys who did a better job than me. 